Lee Hughes. From 1939 to 1945, London was bombarded and blitzed by the Germans, but what was happening just east of London? In this documentary, we will take you through the history of the Second World War within South End. Welcome to South End at War. Today, South End is nothing more than just another seaside town full of arcades and chip shops. But what some people don't know is that if you look at the right places, you can find some ancient history. And one of those places is codenamed TNT also known as Butler's Farm. Welcome to Southland's own heavy anti-aircraft batteries, also known as Butler's Farm. When Britain came under attack from the Germans, Churchill needed a way to defend London from the incoming bombers. One of the ways he decided to do this was by building areas in which large cannons could be placed to shoot down enemy aircraft. These buildings possessed gun pits, bomb shelters, and ammo recess details to provide South End with whatever it's needed to defend itself. This particular building is a HAA battery, which meant it was difficult to spot the cannons, which are 3.7 inches, from the cockpit of an enemy aircraft. Now these cannons were mounted here, on each of the, what I'm going to call, nose points. And then in the middle was the base, which is apparently made out of wood. And if I'm honest, it's very soft now these days. Quite deadly, wouldn't you say? This here is one of the ammo recess details, where ammo was kept for the artillery. And, if you follow me, and I don't get... 50 million twigs in my eyes and I lose my sight, we enter the evacuation bunkers as I'm going to call them. We're in here, the soldiers would have quickly rushed into if the Luftwaffe had discovered this area's location and proceeded to bomb it. Now, it's pretty dark and we're not sure how many people could fit in here, but uh, let's see how much room me and Kevin have under this tiny light source. I mean, yep. it's pretty big. Yep. <laughs> Bigger than Ikea. Yes. <laughs> yes. Well, this is all well and impressive. There was another area in South End that played a key role during the Second World War, and that would be the garrison. I believe that's your bit, isn't it? Yeah, I'd better get going. Yeah, you should get going. Yeah. We ain't got long. Okay. See ya. Bye. Bye. Well, hang on a minute. I forgot to tell Cameron we've got the interview to go to. Oh well, he can wait. Behind me is the Kestrel House, where we have been invited to a talk from two people who lived during South End throughout the Second World War. We are here to listen to their stories. Did, did you know anyone um, at your school on your street who was evacuated? Well, the whole school was evacuated. Um, we weren't evacuated, me and sister. Um, there was about six of us left in Shoebury. The six, six in children. Shoebury. Yeah, six children left. Yeah. <laughs> so we never had any schooling for about two years. It was two years. And then um, by that time I was 12, 11, 12. And that's when I went to Caulfield High School, which is now oh, your school, is it? School. So you didn't have a phone, you didn't have a TV. How did you know the war was over? Well, we had a radio, well, a wireless, you know. Um, well, we knew it was coming. Yeah. And of course, the papers. Talking about it. Yes. Oh. Emotions, feelings. Was well. That we were very, very scared the night when, because we had the shelter, we went, we had one of the Anderson shelters, which had, had done about a six foot hole in the ground, and that was, you've probably seen it on telly, corrugated iron, and then our mum found the tree road with, in the back garden, and one night it was really bad bombing. Well, our dad didn't think our house was going to be standing. 
But I slapped my dad when the pink went out the next morning. The blast had gone the other way because they dropped two bombs. You don't mind me talking about that, do you? Wakeland Avenue, it's all the same houses, but one side of the road is two different houses. The other side of the road is a bungalow, and that's where a bomb. Can I just follow on with that to say that when it first started, Mum wouldn't let us go out to play because they didn't know quite how things were going to be, and then of course they got a bit blasé because I don't think we were getting the bombing hadn't started then, had it, or the planes didn't start to. I mean, yeah, they hadn't started to start till it later. They called it a phony war to start with. But we've seen the sky full of German planes, bombers, um, the fighters, and. And we was over the beach one day, you said, wasn't yeah. it? And a plane was coming out and it came down machine guns to us, but we, we did get us, but we ran and then, away home. And another thing they used to do, when they'd been bombing London, they used to follow the Thames down, then if they'd got any bombs left, they would drop them before they went back to Germany, because they didn't want to take them back. But also, we were a target, because one end of the high street was the barracks, the other end was um, Blackgate, which went on to Bowness, which was proof in experiment of um, the bombs they used to test. So, you know, we, they used to bomb us as well just because of that. So to sum that up, not all children were evacuated during the war and their lives are filled with memories because of it. Good, let's not keep Cavan waiting any longer, shall we? The garrison is very rich in its military heritage and it's very well known amongst Britain. While children were being evacuated, um, the adults, well, mainly the men, were getting ready to defend Britain. So let's see how they did that. I'm standing in a 9.2 inch gun emplacement, or at least what's left of it. Like much else of the garrison's history, new weaponry was being developed all the time, and the result of this um, new artillery weapons uh, led to places like these being built. And the purpose of these places was to shoot down enemy aircraft crossing over from the English Channel, trying to bomb London, South End, uh, other major cities and towns as well. While the artillery was meant to destroy the aircraft, it wasn't actually meant to destroy the actual foundation it was set up on. But as you can see right here, it's exactly what happened. As um, this uh, quickfire battery um, isn't able to cope, or wasn't able to cope, with um, the sheer power of the cannons. And uh, speaking of cannons, just down the road is what would find target for those cannons uh, as um, the stealth attacks came when the sun went down. This is one of two buildings made to house a powerful searchlight to spot enemy warships that was travelling through the Thames or across the English Channel uh, in order to destroy uh, our cargo vessels and, and our own battleship self like HMS Nelson, which actually came to South End in 1945. Uh, I think that's a wrap. Yeah. Not quite! We've got one more interview to go and then there's RAF Rochford. What? Ro Rochford? Well, this is about South End. It's the airport, Captain Aston, South End, last time I joked. Oh, oh yeah, uh, yeah, so, wait, what's the second interview about then? Well, you see, there's just some things we didn't have time to learn in the time we've had to make this documentary. So me and Bradley went to interview a, a historian about her opinions and views on history within South End to see what she knows. Okay, so my name is Belina, um, I'm here working on a Second World War project. This aspect of the project is called the evacuation experience and we chose this particular time because it's 80 years almost to the day when the children of Shoebury Ness were gathered up in the official government evacuation scheme and taken out to the countryside via South End Station. Uh, my background, um, I started at the Essex Record Office, um, so I consider myself a local historian. In the course of doing this project, I found out a lot more. Um, my background further than that is I'm very interested in the Second World War. I have been since I was a child myself, and so I wanted to share some of the knowledge and some of the experiences that I've gained during my lifetime and in particular with having the privilege to talk to people and interview people who were a part of the Second World War. When people were evacuated from South End, do you know where they were sent to specifically or was it all over the place? At the point they set off they didn't actually know, so the children gathered up, knew that they were going to somewhere that was supposed to be safe 
knew that was likely to be the countryside, uh, but at the point that they set up, they and their parents wouldn't have known. Uh, the billeting officers did, well, hopefully they did, um, and the children of Shoebury Ness and Southend ended up evacuated to all sorts of different places. Some didn't actually go very far and were just in the kind of surrounding countryside. Um, some got all the way to Wales. Um, some were even considered to go over to Canada. Um, all sorts of places they could end up. So each different evacuee would tell a different story. Would you say that a lot or not a lot of uh, South End's history from the Second World War has been preserved or should you say more should have been preserved? I, but biased of course, I would like to see more preserved. Um, there are some brilliant oral histories at the Essex Record Office. Um, there are some really interesting diaries and essays that elder people have written remembering their time and their memories of the Second World War. Um, there are some brilliant records connected to this area, but in many ways I think I'd like to see more personal stories. Um, so Army, Navy, Air Force, of course quite well represented, ARP, um, we've got some lovely bomb maps where they plotted all the, the bombs that dropped down, and then you can look at a map like that and go, oh yes, that's where a doodlebub dropped, that's where the V2 hit, but to hear the accounts of the people who saw that and lived through that, how they felt, how they responded, how they rebuilt, a lot that's more personal. the personal stories. In our documentary, we're looking at the garrison. Uh, what do you actually know about the garrison, about how it was created and what it's like today? Oh, actually, that is also an area that I'd like to find out a lot more about. Um, so obviously, I know that there was a garrison there. I know that that was actually an important part of the town before the war even broke out. Um, I know that they were involved in some quite Perhaps secretive isn't the right word, but very important kind of intelligence gathering um, operations. And, and the one in particular that, that stands out to me that I, I fear is becoming a slightly forgotten part of history because it was done so well. Um, there was a particular type of mine, a magnetic mine, and this was attaching itself to ships. They were then coming up the Thames, they were making their deliveries, they were picking up soldiers, ammunition, weapons, and then with very little warning, the mine would go off and, and those ships would be destroyed. If that had been allowed to go on, that would have accounted for the deaths of thousands of um, you know, sailors and, and people on board those ships, as well as so many vital wartime resources, including food, going to the, to the bottom of the sea. However, it was thanks to the garrison at Shoebury Ness that one of these magnetic mines didn't explode. It washed up and very carefully they, they went up to it, <laughs> pulled it apart, worked out how it worked. It was top secret at the time. The British intelligence didn't know much about it. The Germans did, obviously, because they were building them. But it came down to a couple of, of kind of very brave people who walked up to this unexploded mine, took it apart, discovered its secrets, and in doing so, countermeasures were put in place that, again, I know that saved thousands of lives. Thanks for that, Valina. And with that over, we can now move on to something we can tell you about ourselves, RAF Rochford. Nowadays, the airbase is nothing more than just an airport that can take you to France, Spain, or wherever else an airbus could take you. But if you went back to 1939, you wouldn't find many satellites here, as it was a satellite base. But then the aircraft were delivered, and those aircraft consisted of Spitfires, Hawker Hurricanes, and Bristol Bellhams. However, no squadron was actually assigned to the airfield during the Second World War, so it must have been like a free for all between all the squadrons. That must have been interesting for the pilot. While there are no links between the RAF and the airport anymore, there is however one military aircraft that still resides here at the airport. And I'll tell you one thing, it's in better nick than this thing behind me. And this aircraft, although not from the Second World War, is due from a war of sorts. It's from the Cold War, and we would show you it, but the place has kept us closed. So here's some voiceover and some archival footage. This is the Avro Vulcan, 
one of three large bombers built for the RAF just before the Cold War. Introduced just over a decade after the Second World War, this jet still had navigational and bomb aiming equipment from the war in its use, and that's because this plane is made by the same people who made the Avro Lancaster. This plane is a World War II bomber for the jet era. Okay, I think that's enough on the post-war history. South End has a rich history that many of us would not be aware of. And it's crazy to think that a small town like this played a huge role in one of history's biggest wars. Exactly. But we have now come to the part of the documentary where we must say goodbye. And thank you for watching South End. See you next week. <laughs> See you next week. <laughs>